and welcome to the final lecture on period three, which will deal with uh, the administrations of George Washington and John Adams, and in particular their dealings with foreign challenges during this period. And uh, the most pressing was to avoid war. That's, that's their main goal during this time, to avoid war with either France or Britain. So this time period, 1789 to 1815, in is an interesting period of time because what was happening in, in Europe and what was happening in the Americas, there's really a, a correlation of events. You know, George Washington was elected in eight, 1789, the same year that the French Revolution began. And then 1815 is uh, peace between Britain and the United States uh, after the end of the War of 1812, which coincided with the peace treaty in Europe that ended the Napoleon Wars. and for both Europe and the Americas, this ushered in uh, 100 years of relative peace. Uh, as in Europe, they had the, the uh, Congress of Vienna, and it would establish sort of a balance of power in Europe that would last until World War I. And in the Americas, you know, this was their opportunity to just turn their back on Europe, to ignore it, to isolate themselves from events in Europe, and to start facing West. And this is when they really started to expand into the West. So I'd like to think of this as uh, you know, a very distinct period of time in United States history, 1789 to 1850, in embroilment with Europe. So the French Revolution, it divided Americans, and it divided them along the same lines that they had been divided on, the, on economic issues between Federalists under uh, the leadership of Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, uh, George Washington to a degree, and the Jeffersonians under the leadership of Jefferson and others like James Madison. So the Federalists, you know, the French Revolution, it's, it's going to embroil in, uh, war with in Europe, and especially between Britain and France, and the Federalists supported uh, uh, British or, if not, neutrality, which is, neutrality is, in a sense, kind of pro-British. And the f uh, they're trying to create a country of, of trade and commerce, and their biggest market is with Britain. They don't want to uh, go back on that, and they're trying to develop a good relationship with Britain, which is they see as their uh, natural ally. And they, f they looked at what was happening with the French Revolution, the reign of terror, and they're quite disgusted by this, and they're they're people who dislike, you know, the the, the mob and, and this kind of violence, you know, that we'd seen in the Americas with Shea's Rebellion or Bacon's uh, Rebellion. Uh, they don't like this, and they believe in a strong authority to suppress this this kind of of action. And they would say, you know, we're not bound by any treaty that uh, with France. You know, France had come to America's aid, and France was arguing, hey, you know, you you signed an alliance with us. You know, now it's your turn to, to help us. And they would argue, hey, when you when you chopped off the head of the king, that's also when you chopped off the uh, the treaty. You know, they signed uh, a treaty with the king of France. You kill the king, you end the uh, the treaty. Now, the Jeffersonians support the revolutionaries. They see it as an extension of the American Revolution and that they ought to support the, uh, the, the French Revolution and these Republican ideals. Uh, they would say the violence is nece a necessary evil. Uh, Jefferson is famous for saying that the tree of liberty needs to be refreshed with the blood of patriots every once in a while. Uh, that's taken out of context. He wasn't actually saying that with the, the French Revolution, but you know that quote sort of goes on there. You know this idea of a necessary evil, and they are you know the, the, they're still bound by the treaty and they ought to help out the French. So we get two. And so what does Washington do uh, with it? Is he says we must remain neutral. We must stay out of this war. We cannot take sides. In the long run, it's just going to hurt us. And so it's best uh, for America and Americans' interest to, to stay out of it. And it's this idea of real politic. You know, you don't look at what your values are or, you know, like, you know, A, we should help the, f the French because uh, that, uh, you know, they're fighting for Republican values or we should help the British because, you know, they're our m biggest trading partner. You've got to look at what's right for Americans at this time. And he, and he would argue it's to stay out of it altogether. And so this, this idea of isolating and staying neutral, this is uh, a long-standing tradition in American foreign policy, and it seems very different from today, where they're very involved in internationalists uh, in world affairs. But uh, you know, until World War I, they're going to stay out of world affairs, and then after World War I, they'll also go back to isolationism, which won't be broken until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which really 
brings it to a final end. And the this idea of maintaining neutrality is going to really vex Washington. It's going to be a big problem for Adams. It's going to cost Adams politically, and Jefferson is also going to find that uh, it's uh, it's going to be quite a, a problem for him as well. Now, it's not just with the French Revolution and the, the French that they're having problems with. Britain still isn't taking their soldiers out of the uh, out of the Northwest. They're still supplying the natives with with weapons and uh, creating alliances with them. And on the seas, America, uh, the British Navy is attacking American merchant ships because they're trading with France. And they're impressing or basically kidnapping Americans into the Royal Navy, which is common practice during this time uh, to get s uh, sailors. You know, it's not fun being a sailor in the, in the British Navy. So it's quite common for the British uh, Navy to impress or kidnap uh, people into it. You know, you might find yourself, you know, one evening getting drunk at the bar and waking up and you're on a ship. <laughs> that was quite common. And, uh, you know, that they're doing it to Americans is not all that unusual. And this is quite upsetting, um, in particular, the Jeffersonian side. So there's up in the Northwest, we can see there is some fighting going on with Indians. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're getting their weapons from the British. And the British fort's still up there as well, up in Fort Detroit, Fort Miami, and others. So the Washington approaches the British looking for some kind of, of resolution of these problems. And they do sign a treaty known as Jay's Treaty, which again divided the Americans along the same fault lines. The treaty, Britain promised to take away the, their, uh, abandon the forts, which they did not, and there's no enforcement mechanism within it. Uh, Britain said they would compensate for past seizures of, uh, of American goods or impressment, but no mention that they're going to stop doing this. And U.S. would honor their debts, which they did, and there was no resolution on impressments or the natives. So really, the Americans are not getting anything out of this. Uh, which infuriated the Jeffersonians, but the Federalists would argue, hey, we are, we're avoiding war. That's goal number one, and we're in a weak position to negotiate. So they got the best they could, which is no war. Uh, and it did alarm the Spain, who, oh, these two are getting together. And there was a separate treaty, Pickney Treaty. It's not as significant, but it, it led to uh, a good deal that the Americans got out of that. The Jeffersonians say, uh, you know, uh, this is only going to benefit northern merchants. It's a sellout uh, as well. We got our map at this time. You know, you can see they're starting to inch over into the, that those territories. That Kentucky has been expanded in. And with Pinckney's Treaty, it's going to deal with, with Florida down there. This was the high point of Jefferson's uh, administration, avoiding war, uh, is what he m felt most proud about. And uh, he, he gave his final sort of address to the American people, known as his farewell address, uh, shortly afterwards. And in it, he it's a letter to the people of the United States, and it's a sort of a goodbye letter, and his final thoughts. And it's a classic statement of, you know, Republican ideals, and he, he, he lists off a number of dangers that if they go away from these Republican ideals of what could haf happen. Uh, he's worried that the unity of the states is going to disappear, that it's going to uh, it's going to split apart or break apart. And he says, you know, citizens must be responsible citizens. You know, they must pay their taxes, but, you know, taxes should be reasonable. And most important, this idea of the nation staying out of foreign entanglements. He's saying, you know, these Europeans are always going to get involved. You can't pick one over the other because, you know, it's, it's, it's only going to get resentment from one and, and the one that you join will probably forget and so don't get in any permanent alliances and endorse trade with all European powers and not just Europeans around the world. So in comes Adams and you can see in his election we've got a north-south division developing with southern states uh, overwhelmingly choosing uh, Thomas Jefferson who lost and northern um, more to commerce areas choosing John Adams. And he's going to have the same problems of trying to stay out of war with, with France, which leads to this uh, scandal known as the XYV affair. Uh, French are also seizing American merchant ships because they're trading with Britain. 
And so there's a lot of calls for war against France, especially from people within uh, Adam's own party, especially Alexander Hamilton, who's very pro-British. And Adams wants to avoid war. And so he sends a group to negotiate. And this group is, uh, when, when they go to the French court and they ask for a, a meeting with the French foreign ministry, they said, yeah, you can have a meeting, but it's going to cost you money. You've got to bribe us, which is very insulting. You know, to just have a meeting between two levels of government uh, shouldn't involve a bribe on one side. And Americans refuse, you know, to pay this bribe. And then it leads to a, a very strong stirrings of nationalism within the United States and a very strong call, you know, how dare they insult us in this way? War, war, war. Uh, you know, and of course, that's what Adams is trying to avoid, is trying to avoid war. Uh, but they do sort of prepare for war. And uh, they would have three years of sort of undeclared war on the seas. Uh, you know, it's with French trying to attack American merchant ships and then fighting back and everything. But what it does do is it, um, uh, Adams is able to successfully just uh, allay those, those who are calling for war. And, you know, people in his own party. And there's a lot of people urging war. Take Florida, take the Louisiana Territory. Um, and because there's such strong support for it, Adams would probably easily win a second term. But Adams, sacrificing for, for the better good, understanding that war is not the nation's best interest, he avoids war, signs a peace with Napoleon, and then promptly lost uh, the election to, to Jefferson. And he retired from this point from public life and public office. But, you know, he, he did the right thing in, in doing this. Now, before he left office, he passed and Congress passed uh, two very controversial acts, alien, uh, meaning, you know, white ghoul, you know, uh, foreigners, and sedition. Now, with the uh, foreigners, uh, aliens, uh, it extended the time until immigrants could become citizens. And, you know, once you become citizen, you own property, then you can vote. And immigrants tended to support for Jefferson. So it was very political in this one. And they made it easier to deport immigrants, in particular French and those uh, in favor of, of uh, war with France. And that's the idea. This is an anti-immigrant uh, bill aimed specifically at French in the, uh, in the United States. And sedition, you know, uh, going against your own government, words and language that attacks your own government. So fines, imprisonment to anyone critical of the government. And it's designed, you know, it's going to expire at the next term. So, you know, even if Adams lose, uh, you know, the, the next group coming in, they would not be able to use this themselves. Now, this is clearly political. It's clearly designed for those in power at the time, the Federalists, to attack their enemies, uh, Jeffersonians. It's also clearly a violation of the First Amendments. And, you know, Adams is, is passing this forward during a period of, of very strong anti-French hysteria. And it's in this way that he's able to get such an unconstitutional laws passed. So it gets into that idea of, of in politics, there's not just the spectrum of economics, there's also a spectrum of security versus liberty, and Adams really pushing it in that direction of a, of a strong security at the expense of people's liberties. Now, Jefferson and Madison and others are not going to take this uh, lying down. Uh, they respond to this uh, with two resolutions known as the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Resolutions meaning sort of just sort of like an essay or we resolve the following where they attack the Alien and Sedition Acts and, uh, and they attack the policies of Washington and Adams, the neutrality, the economic policy, and uh, very specifically the Alien and Sedition Acts. And it's the very beginning of this idea that uh, the, the states can ignore uh, or nullify national laws if they felt they were unconstitutional. And they're, they're directly addressing at this time the, the Alien and Sedition Act and putting forward the argument that states have the right to leave secession. Well, these, this is the foundation upon which the later the Civil War will commence, that the southern states are going to secede because they uh, 
they feel that the, the northerners are going to destroy their way of life uh, and their, their basis of economics, which is the, the slave labor. So, you know, er, so the early synthesis to later events, this idea of nullification or nullifying uh, or refusing to follow uh, uh, federal or national law that states may do this. So the beginning of this, this divide, political divide between states' rights and uh, the national government, you know, where, where does it begin, where does it end, uh, this kind of argument. All right, well, thank you very much for listening.